I'm Cynthia James, and this network is about changing lives one woman at a time. Hello and welcome to Women Awakening. I'm your host, Cynthia James, and every week I get to introduce you to an amazing woman, someone who has stepped out, stepped up, brought their voice to the planet, stands in their power and invites other people, other women to do the exact same thing. So this is exquisite for me because we are on Spotify and iHeart and Spreaker and Amazon. We're on videos on YouTube. You can also go to CynthiaJames.net. That's my website and see all the things I'm into. Sign up for my newsletter. Um, And um, also there you can just see all the things that I'm doing in my world. So today I have a new friend that I want to introduce you to. And her name is Tuni Degnan. This is what I loved when I looked her up. She is a lifelong storyteller. She danced professionally in Chicago and New York. She owned her own dance studio and was artistic director of a pre-professional youth dance company, T-Move. At age 55, a life-changing event moved her in a different direction, and she began to write Her new book, her memoir, Underwater Daughter, comes out May 2nd, 2023, from She Writes, who is also my publisher. So uh, I am so glad that you're here, Tuni. Thank you so much. Cynthia, thank you. It is an honor to be here. And I have so much mad respect for the work that you are doing in the world, the way you are showing up. Oh, thank you so much. So I want to start kind of at the beginning. I mean, I do want to get to this life-changing event, but, you know, how did you grow up? Well, I began dancing very young at probably the age of four or five and became serious by the time I was eight. I am the youngest of four children in a very sort of highly cultured highly intellectual family household. I also experienced, um, sadly, some inappropriate parenting, um, primarily um, initiated by my father and sort of um, ignored by my mom. Mm -hmm. And so that was a, a very big impact on how I moved through the world as a child. And dance actually became my saving grace in many ways. I channeled all of my confusion and uh, just self-doubts and and struggles into my creative life Mm -hmm. as a very young person. You know, I did something very similar. You know, my um, stepfather was a pedophile and a wife beater, and my mother said she didn't know everything that was going on. But I think, and that could be true because she was in her own web of whatever was happening there. And and I used creativity too, to get me out my singing and my being visible in school and stuff like that. And so, so um, what made you think that you could be a professional and, and, make a living at this thing called creativity and dance? Um, Well, I never gave up dancing. There was a time, I mean, because I started so young, when I turned 11, I was already burnt out on it, Mm -hmm. right? And I segued into a theater school and that was an amazing experience. I learned all the arts, right? Theater, improv, voice, um, still dancing, and became involved in in all of their main stage children's theater productions, right? Sadly, because I was also, I think that this is common. Um, People that have experienced trauma kind of show up in the world as that person. People can pick you out. So I was again picked out during that my time there. So I went back into dance, left that completely, 
and was hired by a company when I was 15, it's still in Minnesota, because I grew up in Minnesota. And then once I graduated high school, there wasn't even a conversation about college. It was, I'm off to Chicago. I was hired before um, I got the diploma in my hand and my career just took off. And That's really interesting. I, I, I grew up in Minnesota. Oh my gosh, I didn't know that. What city were you in? Twin Cities, Minneapolis. Me too. Me too. What school? <laughs> Golden Valley High School. Oh, I went to South High. <laughs> oh my gosh. So my all of my nephews went to South. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, yeah. so I want to talk about, because when I was reading your bio, you were talking about all of these oh, wonderful things that had gone on. But I want to talk about this bike accident. Mm. Yeah. That because was, it, that was a that was a pivotal moment for you. Let's well, talk about that and what came out of it. Okay. So I had just closed a dance studio that I had opened, you referred to earlier. And we moved to Indiana following my husband's job. And a week after we moved, I pulled my bike out to take a ride with my husband on Father's Day. And the movers had disassembled it and reassembled it incorrectly. They weren't even supposed to touch the bike. And it just spun out of control underneath me as I was riding. I was probably going about 13 miles an hour or something like that. But that's kind of like a car accident for mm -hmm. someone on a bike. And um, it took out all of my ability to basically be a moving, active person. I was bedridden for months and months. I was on opiates for months and months. And I had an identity crisis. I was, I just didn't know who I was anymore. And I turned to the only thing I really could do because I was basically not even able in the beginning to walk very well because I was literally like plastered up and so drugged up. And I would, and I had my little pinky fingertips, all my fingertips peeking out of my um, exoplast, you know, splints. And I started tapping on a keyboard. Mm -hmm. And what immediately started to come out was besides who am I, was this traveling back to my childhood and really starting to take it apart and trying to understand what happened and why I made the decisions that I made. And it really led me to forgiveness, honestly. Mm. Through, I mean, it took a while, but that's where it led me. Well, you know, isn't it interesting how oftentimes what looks like a crisis is a transformational moment? Um, and so, first of all, I just want to say, a, I'm sorry that that happened to you. And to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And and while you were in this cast and you know not being able to move, how how was it dealing with your husband as all these things were coming forward in your life? Yeah. So when we moved to Indiana, I'm actually a mother of five. So Bless you. <laughs> and that was a, such a huge chunk of my existence, right? From segueing from the dance into motherhood. And that was just a pouring out of my creative life into these five children. At this point, after the accident, my son, my youngest, was the only one home and he was a freshman in high school and he, we just had moved. Literally, we knew no one in the community. So I didn't want to be a burden to him. My husband was working full time. I essentially was self-caring through the very early stages of this convalescence. And what ended up happening, too, thankfully, was my oldest flew in for a week and did, you know started to help out. And my kids kind of cycled in and out for me. Mm -hmm which without that, um, I would have been SOL <laughs> mm -hmm. because, you know, my, you know, he couldn't stop, he couldn't just stop everything and help me. And, and so it was, um, they were, my kids once again came and saved me. 
Yeah. Well, what I love is, you know, oftentimes when people have been through the kind of childhoods we've been through, mm-hmm. you know, the dysfunction follows into the family. Yeah. And then other times it's it's the saving grace for the heart that you get to do have a do-over in terms of, of family and what that means. So so as you're writing this book, I'm assuming that there were a lot of emotions that came forward. Mm-hmm. What did you discover? Yeah, you know, there was a lot of tears, no question. And at the same time that I was moving through the process of this manuscript, about a year after the accident, I actually moved my mom to an assisted living. She was in Florida and I moved her to Indiana where I was living and about a less than a mile from me. And so I'm writing and diving into these really impactful times of my childhood while I'm also starting to assume the reversal of our roles and being her caregiver and really wanting her time on this planet, you know, to end in a loving fashion and end with her knowing how much I love her and, and want her to find that ease, that inner peace, you know, so it was a very heavy, intense process. Uh to this day, because my mom actually ended up getting the COVID and, um, you know, we lost her in 21. And um, the the memoir, which I love the way you pronounce that word memoir, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) But, um, you know, the actual physical book landing in my hands was it was an another extremely emotional milestone for me, because it was tied, the process was tied so fully with this transitional relationship with my mom. Mm -hmm. So it's just been, it's, it's been an incredible process for me. And what the other thing I've learned through this is it's not ending. Like the writing continues, the, the ability to speak to others such as yourself about the process continues to to reveal more insights and more aha moments of understanding and compassion and the you know showing me the ways in which I want to show up in the world the ways in which I want to encourage others to show up in the world it's it's just been a an unexpected blessing really yeah you know they don't tell you that you're going to become the parent of the parent and then have to go through um, whatever transitional moment that is. I want to talk about forgiveness. I want to talk about how you got to forgiveness. <laughs> yes, I love that you just brought this up. Um, I was just at the Woodstock Book Festival uh, last weekend in New York. And Sophronia Scott, an, uh, another author, was speaking. She's actually um, a parent of a child that was in the school in Connecticut. Uh, for some reason, the name of the school uh, is escaping me right now. And Sandy Hill. What the shootings were? Sandy Hill. So Sophronia Scott's son, who was a first grader at the time in lockdown, lost his best friend, right? And she hasn't written specifically about this incident, but or or how it impacted her life, her son's life, her family's life. But at one point, the essayist Roxane Gay wrote an essay about Charlottesville, which happened after Sandy Hill. And and in Roxane's article, she um, was really stating her inability to forgive the the um, shooters, right? And Sophronia wrote this amazing essay in response to that article about forgiveness. Um, a house divided unto itself. What what's going to happen, right? There's just going to be more conflict and and disarray and and the inability to move forward. And she she actually uses this wonderful um, sort of parable about 
this this inability to forgive, right? You're in a cage and you're a lion tamer with the tiger. And the tiger is this, this evil, right? And your inability to tame the tiger is your inability to forgive the tiger. So the tiger continues to circle you. The issue, the conflict, the shooter, the perpetrator, the pedophile continues to be this constant, you know, oh, I just cannot forgive. And you're on high alert. You're on, you're ready to tame at every moment this, you know, to, to come back at the, the perpetrator, right? So you the incident doesn't leave you. Mm-hmm. It's still consuming you, right? It's still part of your identity. When if if you can take the step to forgiveness, it's not that the person is a, isn't accountable, they're accountable, but you get to remove that storyline from how you're going to operate and move forward in the world, right? Right, right. Which it's, it's really you letting go of the judgments and the perceptions that hold you hostage, That's separate right. and apart from That's what right. they did and. Uh, uh, and yeah, it's 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 a journey. It's a it's a powerful journey. But but did you feel that when you were writing that that the ability to open your own consciousness and move into that state of forgiveness, it, it became a portal? Oh yeah, like in what ends up happening for me, I and I don't I'm not sure what which comes first, the chicken or the egg, in the sense that. I end up having dreams where it's I've entered that portal and I've I've found another source of compassion and survival. Mm -hmm. I have found the place to thrive. Yeah. 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 Well, it's beautiful. And it's 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 beautiful to watch how you're emerging. And I want to talk about, I want you to hold the book, but I I want to talk about serendipity because your book is coming out just at the same time as the accident a number of years later. Mm. Yes, it is. (laughs) Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? You know, the accident initially was such a mind I could use one word. I'll use a different word. (laughs) Incident, right? But it, like you said, it became another portal for me to really just find my own truth with all of it. So I have not been on a bicycle since June of 2018. I've been on a stationary one. (laughs) And, but it's going to happen. And the other thing about that is I have known since I was very young that trauma, crises, challenges in people's lives. And I mean, I've known this since I was a little girl, that they are catalysts for becoming something else, for overcoming always. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I want you to hold up your book. For those of you who are on Spotify or or one of the other platforms, you won't be able to see it, but I just, it's called Underwater Daughter and it's a memoir of survival and healing. And so what I want you to do is read a couple of the testimonials from your book. Um, uh, what other people are saying about the gift that you've given through your writing. Thank you. That's awfully generous of you to allow me to share that. So the Kirkus Review, which is, as authors know, it's the trade review that you really want to sort of get the nod from. I, I got a beautiful review from them. The pull quote from it on my book is Degnan's writing style is courageously confessional and creatively descriptive, an elegantly written and harrowing remembrance of the long-lasting impact of childhood trauma. Gorgeous. So, and then um, another blurb that's on the back of my book is from Julie Barton. She's the New York Times bestselling author of Dog Medicine. She wrote, 
Underwater Daughter is an unflinchingly brave and nuanced memoir with lyrical prose so inventive it will take your breath away. Degnan's book is a life-giving siren song to memory, the body, family, survival, forgiveness, and ultimately love. Wow. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, um, tell us how we get your book because it's coming out in May of 2023. <laughs> Girl, it is right around the corner. <laughs> so it um, is available at Amazon and other online booksellers. And if you go to my website, which is my name, AntoniaDegnan.com, all the information for either pre-ordering, which if this airs after date, then it wouldn't be a pre-order, but all the different booksellers are listed on my website. Yeah. yeah. Well, I just wish you so much luck. I I, I just think it's beautiful to, to be opening and to be that vulnerable to share your story so that others can heal. Mm. So I... I ask the same last question of every person on my show. Mm -hmm. The show is called Women Awakening. What mm -hmm. do you think is the most important thing for women awakening on the planet in this moment? I think that women have to firmly believe that we're all on the same team. We have to be a team. We have to let go of fear. We have to let go of the ego's domain, the ego's ability to sidetrack us and commandeer what comes out of our mouths and the way we, that we behave. We have to be faith-filled, compassionate, kind people. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, you're beautiful and um you Looking forward to reading here. your book. I'm so <laughs> happy to have been here with you today. I love being with you. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right, ladies. So I always close the same way. I want to remind you how magnificent you are, how brilliant you are, how courageous you are, and how powerful you are. When you can step into the ownership of what I've just said to you, miraculous things occur. Your creativity expands. Your willingness to step forward becomes easy and grace-filled because the truth is that the world is waiting for you. You're here by a divine appointment. And so I'm so grateful that I get to introduce you to women who can model for you the possibilities of your life. Thank you for being here and I'll see you in a week. <music>